I'm standing above the actual Jacobs Creek itself, and the sign comes and goes depending on the frequency of souvenir hunters. Right across the road is the Jacobs Creek Visitor Centre, the Bross's busiest cellar door. And we've come here to go behind the scenes of this famous brand and uncover the stories and secrets behind Jacobs Creek. At Richmond Grove, we have our own proprietary oak oven. So we season, partially season some of our, our French oak staves here in Australia, but then we toast them ourselves. So that allows us to control the, the process, the profile of oak that we're going to get. Um, we've been working on this for, for a long time before I even started in the business. Um, so at the time when we started developing this technology, it wasn't widely available with different businesses and, and oak suppliers. So now um, with these oak ovens, we can control the duration, the temperature, um, and where, you know, or even sometimes you know, how long or little we get. So it's really deciding the style of wines and it helps us drive whether it's going to Chardonnay or Shiraz or Cabernet or Merlot, these different things that we want to get out of our, own, out of our oak. Um, you know, there's been a few mishaps along the way. It's quite a sensitive process in terms of how hot you can go before the oak catches on fire. So there have been instances, you know, where the oak can catch on fire when it comes out of the oven or the oak shed burns down. But, um, you know, it's been an interesting process. But the important thing is it gets us, we can control our own uh, quality and style of the, the staves that we get. Um, and it really helps influence, you know, Jacobs Creek classic wines and, and the direction that we want to, we want to take them. Uh, so the wine studio has really developed as a space for innovation at Jacobs Creek. So most people when they think Jacobs Creek they think of us as a rather large winery um, with a reasonably large label as well. Um, so the way we think of this is it's really a boutique winery uh, within a large winery, almost like a babushka doll I guess you could call it. Um, and if you look around, you can see a lot of small vessels, a lot of small tanks, and this is really a space for us that um, sparks and, and fosters innovation from a small scale and a lot of trial work as well. Um, if we do something here that works on a small scale, then the, the vision would be that we'd roll it out at a much larger scale and hopefully make our wines look all the much better for it. So one of the wines that we've processed through, through here recently is um, Tamarinto. It's a variety that we normally wouldn't have been able to keep separately. Um, we decided to do a little bit of uh, skin contact to start off with, um, with half of the portion and we pressed off the other half straight to, to tank. Um, so we cold settled that and we're fermenting that out now. Uh, the other half we actually did a little bit of ferment on skins as well. So we've pressed that off and um, we're fermenting the rest of it out in barrels. So that's something we'd normally not get to do. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see what's going to happen there. So in terms of the structure of the uh, wine studio, we've got full capacity all the way from intake uh, to ferment, uh, fermentation and then getting our wines uh, to a bottle ready state. Uh, so we've got um, a sorting table, a vibrating sorting table. The purpose of that is really to get consistency of flow rate. Um, so really uh, that consistency and, and I guess smoothness of processing is uh, what makes your um, the finer wines really shine. Um, there's also the ability to sort, um, so you can hand sort out um, fruit. Uh, we've got a, a grape uh, elevator there as well, which also feeds can, can feed the press with whole bunch whites. For instance, it could also potentially feed um, open fermenters and um, feed reds as well. Uh, we've got a, a state-of-the-art um, Europress Scharfenberger uh, destemmer and crusher as well, obviously with the, the function there just to um, destem or you could crush your grapes as well. From there we've also got a roller sorter in there as well. That's really important in a vintage like this where you might get really variable fruit set um, or what we would call hen and chicken as well. Um, so this means we're able to um, really pick the eyes out of the vineyards and get some of those um, larger berries and smaller um, berries and other um, matter other than grapes or what we in the industry call mog. Um, we can get all of that out as well. Um, from, and from there as well, we've got a whole range of um, red fermenters as well. So three tonne all the way down to half tonne fermenters. Um, and in terms of um, wine tanks as well, we've got as small as 300 litres up to um, 2,200 litres as well. We're finding that consumers are drinking a lot more new grape varieties, a lot more wine styles. We're seeing um, wine regions that perhaps you hadn't potentially heard of or, or, or known of um, really coming into the, into the forte and uh, consumers are interested in that. What that means for us is um, as, a, as a wine business, typically our strength has been in um, kind of medium to large production 
Um, so things like Jacob's Creek Classic Chardonnay, um, which is a real you know stalwart uh, stalwart um, wine in, in many households. Um, we've we've been able to do that very very well, but on a much smaller scale, we we have uh, struggled a little bit um, just by um, the infrastructure of scale. So this wine studio now gives us the ability to process everything from a, a really boutique. Um, scale all the way up to um, one of our larger um, larger blends as well. So previously vineyards with or grape varieties which may have been lost um, just due to the, that large infrastructure we now have the capabilities to, to keep keep separate and really let those wines shine. We can do a lot of trial work um, on a small scale and really try and find out what works uh, and what doesn't and that's equally as important. This place isn't about everything succeeding, it is about learning from your mistakes or learning from your failures because we all, we all make them. Um, and I guess with that, um, you know, if you're talking about 300 litres of something, that's not, a massive, that's not a massive fail for a winery like us. We can absorb that. So in terms of being able to keep everything separate, we can look at, say, these four tanks here and we could look at how QA23 um, performs against CH7, uh, against EC1118 or against DB10 on a Riesling trial, on a Riesling trial, and we can actually taste those wines individually, monitor the ferment dynamics, really um, kind of dissect what's happening with that, and then um, whatever we would deem as a success, take that um, to a larger scale and actually um, implement that um, in the wines that we're making. So it's a really exciting, really exciting space because we've got abilities to trial yeast, we've got abilities to trial skin contact, we could look at the influence of tannins on red wine, we could look at the influence of a punch down on an Adelaide Hills Pinot versus a pump over. We can do all of this and then um, walk away from it with a real, um, real depth of knowledge. We're very fortunate, um, just one and a half k's north of here is our Jacobs Creek Visitor Centre. It is uh, one of the most, uh, if not the uh, most visited um, space by tourists when they visit the Barossa. So it's um, important as um, from, from our region that we're really putting our best foot forward because for some tourists that may be the only exposure that they have to wine is our visitor centre. So um, if the winemakers here are happy with some of the wines that they make, there's no reason that w we couldn't release it under our um, limited release range. Um, we've done that in the past. So last year we released uh, a 2018 um, Semillon from the banks of Jacobs Creek, which was a really nice story. Uh, 2017, we released an Adelaide Hills Gruner Veltliner. Um, again, some of these vineyards, um, by Barossa terms, they're not large, but for us, they um, we would consider them to be relatively small. Um, but now um, we can process really as small as a ton, even less, um, even less than that. I mean, we've got half ton fermenters here, and if that's a success, and and we're happy with the wines and um, we want to show them to the public than we can because our limited release range is very much about what we as winemakers want to be making um, and giving an insight um, to our consumers as to the type of wines that we're interested in. And it, it's, it's a place that where you can really learn, where you can really grow as a winemaker. When I compare the, the knowledge that I entered into in this place, I would say the, the knowledge and experience that I've gained from working here is tenfold. I've learnt so much more here and I know that when I stop learning that that's, uh, that's a sign that uh, I probably shouldn't be here anymore but to be perfectly honest with you I don't see that happening anytime soon. Not when you see an amazing space like this being built because as I said that knowledge is being fostered and, and growing and that's, that's really the big difference between, here, between Jacobs Creek and other producers. Whether it's in the vineyard, whether it's um, picking something early, whether it's letting it hang for another um, two or three weeks, um, whether it's the choice of yeast you use, whether it's you ferment hot or cold, um, it's all these, it's almost like a choose your own adventure book because only you know where you want to be and how you're going to get there. And this, this period is, is really where it happens. Um, the rest of it is extremely important, but this is, this is the business end of winemaking. And, and that's why I love it so much. We're here on the banks of Jacobs Creek, which is our original site. We had our founder's old original winery here behind me, which was built in 1847, and his beautiful cottage to my left-hand side. But just through the lovely vineyard here, which is where uh, Johan planted that in 1847, uh, is our beautiful meandering Jacobs Creek. And two miles just downstream from where we are here on the banks of the creek sits our Jacobs Creek brand home. 
and we see around about 150,000 visitors to that brand home each year. And one of the nicest things is often people don't realise that there really is a creek and it does have water in it and it flows through, uh, through the, the beautiful Barossa Valley here. And a lot of our vineyards are either side of that creek because back in Johan's time, the creek was, was of course the water source. And so it's lovely to, to have these vineyards. And the visitor centre itself, um, we do a lot of um, small batch wine making there as well. So we make um, uh, wines that would normally, uh, that normally people wouldn't see. We make just that, you know, they're all, they're all kept very separate when we, they go into the winery. And of course, as you drive into Nunda, you see the beautiful Jacobs Creek archway, which was, plant, which was built in uh, 1947 for the very, very first uh, Barossa Vintage Festival, uh, built by Johan's great grandson, Colin Grant, who's still with us today. Our brand Jacobs Creek we launched in 1976 as part of a range called the Vineyard Range. And each of the wines, there was four wines in the white range, three whites and one red. And each of those labels was named after predominantly the region where the vineyards were based. And the whites were from different parts of the Brossa Valley, but the red was named Jacobs Creek because predominantly the Shiraz component all came from our beautiful vineyards along the banks of Jacobs Creek. Now, we stand here today on the banks of Creek, but our history here actually goes back to our founder, Johann Grant, who in 1847 uh, moved here from Bavaria in Germany, escaping religious persecution, and was one of the first people in our colony. So he came here uh, and built this beautiful little uh, old winery behind me in his beautiful cottage that we're standing here today. Um, and not only did Johann begin our wine business back in 1847, but also the Bross as a commercial wine region uh, now, which is uh, known internationally. So we stand here today on a, next to a little vineyard that was planted originally in 1847, and we replanted it uh, in 1997 to mark the 150th anniversary of our brand. So over those uh, years, our brand, um, which is now in many, many countries around the world, has very, very humble beginnings here along the banks of our lovely creek. And so my family came to the Brossa Valley in 1850, and we still have the original family farm blocks today in the north part of Mopper. Um, so my, um, I'm now sixth generation in the Brossa Valley. But I joined the company many, many years ago, yeah, 26 years ago, but it was actually called Orlando Wyndham. But I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, but our beautiful heritage site here is really much the heart and soul of our business uh, because our founder, Johan Graham, came here to this very place, this very, uh, this will say his old winery behind me, his beautiful cottage to our left, and, or, or, and banks of Jacobs Creek behind us. And it's here in 1847 that our founder, Johan Graham, planted the first commercial vineyard here in the Brossa Valley. But there's actually three really interesting stories that meet here in our heritage and history. And uh, really it was about the history of our state politically, the history of us as a wine brand, and also the history of the Brossa Valley as a world uh, showcase of Barossa Shiraz. So at the very beginnings of our, uh, our colony here in South Australia, we were the very last of the, South, of the Australian colonies to be set up. And it was actually set up as a private business based in London called the South Australian Company. And the South Australian Company owned the beginnings and the rights to the colony of South Australia, even before government. And Colonel Light was sent out here, who was a British officer as the Surveyor General. And he surveyed and drew up the city of Adelaide. And Adelaide's actually a complete square mile. And when he did that, uh, the governor of the day actually wanted the city to be on Kangaroo Island, but Kangaroo Island doesn't have any underground water. So it sits now right in the middle of the Adelaide Plain, a square mile with a beautiful band of parklands all the way around. So very uh, picturesque city, Adelaide. Uh, but what he did do, Colonel, Light, Colonel William Light, he brought an assistant surveyor with him from London called William Jacob. And when they came back up here after the city had been surveyed and drawn, they came up and did some survey work through the Brossa Valley here. And Light was trying to find a pass through the Mount Lofty Ranges because back in those days, the big transport corridors was, was the river system. We had, you know, the river boats and the big inland ports. And he found that. He found, in fact, we've got a little village here called Light Pass uh, just to the north of where we're standing today. Um, but while all that was going on, the, the, the Kaiser, the king in Germany, um, was, was persecuting some of the, uh, there were sort of two sides to the Lutheran church. And so one of the Lutheran pastors went to London and spoke to George Fife Angus, who headed up the South Australian Company, and now, of course, our gorgeous little town here in the Brossa, Anguston is named after George Fife Angus. And the Lutheran pastors went to him and said, look, you know, you've got this uh, colony on the side of the world, because it was actually the first Australian colony that um, 
didn't have convicts, but it was actually the first Australian colony that, that preached religious freedoms. And even today, the city of Adelaide uh, is known as the city of churches, be, um, not because we've got great big churches, we, we don't really, but we have a diverse um, variety. And, and I think even the, the beautiful mosque in Adelaide um, is, the, is the oldest mosque in Australia. And because our inland was all opened up by the Afghan cameleers, uh, in beautiful North Adelaide, the, you know, the Quakers meeting place. Um, it's a beautiful, tiny little old building. They're still here today and they're still open and, and being used. So it was about religious freedoms. So within the first 18 months, we had 2000 of these German migrants, these Lutherans uh, came here. And it was a good system because they were what we called bonded migrants. So they, they had their passage paid for by the South Australian company. But when they got here, they had to work for, for three years for the, as a bonded migrant was a really fast and efficient way of building a, building a colony. But they were paid quite handsomely, so it wasn't uh, slave labour, not even close to it. And when they'd finished their three years bond, they were actually given access to uh, farming land or uh, for a cheaper price. And the very first ship of those uh, German migrants that landed on Kangaroo Island was our founder, Johan Grant, who came here. He made his uh, fortune on a small farm in the northeastern suburbs of Adelaide. But the government of the day bought his farm off him for what is now one of Adelaide's biggest reservoirs. So, and he got paid quite handsomely for it. So 10 years to the day that he arrived here, right at the beginning of the colony, he purchased this very place we're standing on today. And behind me, in 1847, he built his first winery and the beautiful little cottage here three years later. So the beginnings of our colony, beginnings of the Barossa as a wine region and the beginnings of the, the, the Barossa Valley as a wine region and our brand, all begins here. So for us, it's a very, very important place. So those three little stories um, all become part of our heritage and our history. And beautifully today, the Jacobs Creek flows uh, through mostly along the edges of our Barossa uh, vineyard. So, you know, we're never very f far away from, um, you know, our, our Barossa roots. So when Johan was about to hand over in, to his son Gustav in 1877, he bought our Roland Flat property down the road. And Rowland's flat was named after an, an English colonialist that had farmed, had, had built the first farm there. And uh, when, when Gustav decided to do that, in the early 1900s, it was a time when brand names were really popping up. You know, M. Gorey Tea was on every railway station and Pears Soap. So he decided that instead of it just being Gramps Wines, he would call it Gramps Orlando Wines. And what he did was, the name, the name Orlando is actually the European derivative of Roland. So it was actually a, an English name, named after an English family, um, and in German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, that the name is Orlando. So it, was a, it wasn't a family member, it was just that lovely European connection back to where his family had come from. So Orlando Wines, as a brand, was born in, then in 1909 to 1912, and he actually handed over the business at a very young age to his son Hugo. So Hugo Gramp, took over our wine business. Hugo Grant took over as a 25 year old and really changed the wine industry. And sadly, he was killed uh, in the, the infamous uh, Kaima air crash in which Hugo Grant was killed along with Tom Hardy and Sidney Hill Smith from the Smith & Sons Yolamba family. So the three great wine barons, if you like, of the day, um, all on board were killed. They hit Mount Dandenong. They were on their way to Canberra, the capital here, to to actually lobby the Prime Minister about the wine tax. But Hugo uh, was a really inspirational man and he really changed the Australian wine industry. And so his legacy actually still lives on with our St Hugo brand name. And to our delight, uh, Colin, his son, who was another great um, pioneer, Colin Graham, um, is still with us today. Colin had his 97th birthday last um, October and we see Colin um, in our beautiful cafe and restaurants every couple of weeks and uh, he still has a little drive around with us during vintage, uh, particularly his um, his beautiful Steingarten vineyard that's become so famous and that he built up there on that rocky outcrop in 1962. Um, and then jumping forward uh, five generations, in the early 1970s the, the, the wine industry here was changing and Orlando Wines, uh, the Grant family ended up selling out of Orlando Wines to Reckitt's or Reckitt and Coleman, the, the British supermarket distributor at the time, and they had ownership of the company uh, for 17 years up until uh, 1988 when they went through a process of a management buyout by the, the four uh, people that were actually running the business here 
and they ran it for um, about 18 months. And because the, the Jacobs Creek brand particularly had grown so rapidly um, around the markets in the world and of course domestically, that they needed more investment to keep the flow of grape supply, vineyards. So uh, they sold a part share to Group Pernaricar in 1989 and then the final uh, shareholding in 1990. And when the business was taken over by Pernaricar, we then had this really big burst of, of uh, development of vineyards, um, which have really kept the brands going. And so Orlando uh, stayed Gramps Orlando up until um, uh, the very um, early 2004, 2005, when, oh sorry, in the 1980s, late 1980s, we became Orlando Wyndham because part of that process was they bought the Wyndham Estate brand in the Hunter Valley. And so we became Orlando Wyndham. In fact, the business was Orlando Wyndham when I started. And uh, that then progressed to being, uh, so then Orlando Wines had these really, really large, strong brands. So our corporate identity uh, in the early 2000s became Pernod Ricard Pacific, Pernod Ricard Australia. And today we're known as premium winemakers uh, because our, our, our French connection has actually decentralized their model. So now that all our, our wine making businesses throughout the world are managed by our business here in Australia. So, uh, it, it was important for us to actually have that connection with our, our brethren in Spain, Argentina, um, France and, and China, uh, where we have vineyards. And so um, it's another name today, but it's quite funny because um, locally, everybody still says they work for Orlando's. And so it's quite a, um, I think the old habits die hard. We're a very traditional culture here, which um, I think all wine regions tend to be. But so we still call ourselves Orlando's, but we still have great brands such as Jacobs Creek and Gramps even as a brand itself and St Hugo. So for us, um, that journey has been really important because um, you know, I think you know, in, 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 across the world in all the different wine regions, history and heritage is really important. And for us it's about that, it's about that history and heritage identity and, and certainly our roots in the Brossa Valley you know, all started back here in 1847. I run a QA team with five people with uh, three QA technicians and two QC technicians. Uh, we have about five production lines and a keg line here on site. And just to give a little bit of, of understanding uh, the volumes going through is that one of our table lines run about 25,000 bottles an hour and the sparkling line about 10,000 bottles an hour. My job is very diverse, I must say. Um, so we are always saying basically we have five production lines here. Uh, T2, one of our lines run at approximately 24,000 bottles an hour and our sparkling line 10,000 bottles an hour and our department is there to make sure that um, whatever goes out the door is to the quality standard that we do want. So the quality standards that we uh, are certified to is the ICE 9001 and also FSSC 22000 which is a food safety certification. The difference between FSSC 22000 and HACCP is that FSSC is, is a broader Certification is not just focused on HACCP, but also entails that you need to have a neat and clean environment. Uh, you need to make sure you have your hygiene in place to you know, make sure that you don't have food in the packaging holes, etc. So it's, it's a bit wider than just focusing on the food safety risks. The differences between QA and QC for me is that QA focuses more on the systems uh, to make sure they are there, as I said, for, for for production to do a good quality product. And QC is more focused on, I guess, the product and in the moment. So QA makes sure that the audit packages and the shop travelers and the specifications are there. And QC is then there as a support on the shifts when they're running to make sure to guide them through if they have any issues and also take responsibility. The QC function is responsible to actually release the stock after production. So in terms of critical control points, we actually did the review not too long ago with the food safety team. And based on that review, we have now only have low and medium risks uh, based on all the controls you already have in place. So we actually don't have any critical control points at the moment. So to ensure that we have traceability in everything that we produced, uh, we do print lot codes. Actually, we do it both on the bottle, so we know when the bottle was filled we print it on the back labels to know when it was labeled. And then we also have a lot code on the outer case, the shipping case. Uh, so if there would be an issue, either if it's just a customer complaint or if it would have to go down the path of a full product recall, we can trace it back exactly when it was produced 
and then from there know where the stock has been sent and to what customers. So the format of lot coding that we use is, is a five digit to start with, so it's a, a one digit for the year, and then it's a Julian date, so you say, I don't know, day 165 is sometime in, I don't know, July maybe. Uh, and then we also have a timestamp to just narrow down even more so we know when it was produced. And uh, also for any you know, future complaints or if we need to check stock, we also keep reference samples for all the work orders that we do. Uh, so we can go back in case and just double check or taste it or analyze it or whatever we may need to do. The QA department's role doesn't just entail to actually keep sort of a track or make sure that we produce sort of the finished good, high quality product. We also need to make sure that the requisites that we do use, so cartons, bottles, labels, up to a certain standard. So as part of that, sort of we, all, we actually audit all our suppliers and we also do audit if we have co-packers that do some value adding for us. So that's part of our whole, well, I would say the RC systems that we do audit them, yeah. Some of the requisites issues that we can have is, yes, the color, the color not matching on the actually printed carton when it comes in. Uh, as part of our processes, we do also what we call a first delivery check, which means that when the dry goods is delivered the first time, QA gets a physical sample from our dry goods store and we look at that compared to the final artwork PDF that has been approved just to make sure that everything adds up. So there you would actually pick up if there are any printing issues or words missing, misspelling or something like that. But then also further down the track, you may have delivery issues. So with glass, for example, uh, if a pallet comes in and, and the, the wrapping on the pallet would be ripped or they would have holes in them, we reject the pallets straight away because you could potentially have contamination issues. The biggest challenge is associated with my job is, is probably to not have enough hours in the day sometimes. Uh, it's a really, really fun job, but you don't know what you encounter when you walk in in the morning. We're at Jacobs Creek Visitor Centre in the middle of the Barossa Valley, um, rolling flat to be specific. And we're here just having a look at the um, solar panels. So this is our first uh, foray into solar and that was back in 2016. So since then these are about 30 kilowatts each. We're installing 3000 kilowatts of, of solar at the moment. One of, the, one of the things that we've been working here at Jacobs Creek is um, uh, our stewardship of the local creek. We don't see us as owners of the creek, but more um, custodians and, and trying to preserve the habitat and make it better for the next generation. And one of the things that we, we, we've been working on recently is um, extending our native vegetation plantings and trying to bring that native vegetation um, back into the vineyards and create um, corridors and stepping stones where wildlife can travel all the way from Kaiser Still in, in the eastern um, part of the Barossa Valley down to the Para River in the central valley. Jackie's Creek runs from a east-west direction and it's really quite important to link the, um, the, the main valley with uh, Kaiser Still up in the, in the eastern parts and give these little corridors and, and stepping stones. So we've been working with the local landowners um, who, who are supporting this resilient landscape concept and um, all down from north to south all these parallel little tributaries are uh, being replanted and forming these nice little corridors that are linking the, the different parts of the valley. Yeah, so we've, we've taken the lead from some of the indigenous people in the area who see themselves as a, as a custodian and the people of the land and we like that concept. Um, what we see is that we're not the owners of the creek, we're the custodians, there'll be another generation come on after us and we want to make sure that we preserve the land and, and the creek and it's in a great position to hand on to the next generation. At, at the moment um, Jacobs Creek is very dry, it's pretty obvious that there's not uh, much water flowing at the moment but it's part of the natural habitat of um, this part of Australia and while there might not um, appear to be much water in the creek at the moment, the water is actually still flowing down through the rocks and there's a lot of aquatic life that lives down and amongst those rocks. Um, some of the fish and the crustaceans will actually adapt to that. They'll be down in the mud or where there are pools or they'll be laying eggs and they'll come away when the, when the creek again starts to flow um, come midwinter or, or late, late autumn rainfall. Double barrel fruit is sourced for the reds, you know, premium regions within South Australia, but we're looking for regions, you know, the Brossa, McLaren Vale, Padthway, that can give us a generous and an intense fruit profile. Like I was saying, we want to, to be able to handle that double barrel process. Um, so in terms of yielding, we want it to be, you know, relatively low yielding, 
good concentration, so that intensity of tannin and flavour. And so that means that out in the vineyard, how it's pruned, how it's grown, the level of uh, irrigation, um, keeping the, the bunches and the berries small, not having them blown out. So that gives us that colour, it gives us the tannin, gives us the flavour profile that we're really looking for um, to build such a robust style of wine. Um, and then it's about the double barrel process coming and smoothing that tannin profile. So when it goes out to the market, people can really see that, you know, intensity of fruit, but that smoothness that comes along with it as well. So a lot of attention to detail into, uh, you know, setting up the vineyard in terms of pruning, uh, growing season, and then when you harvest it as well and tasting it and making sure it's physiologically ripe out there in the vineyard as well. At the moment, we're standing in front of the double barrel barrel. So I guess this is the double part of the double barrel story. Um, you know, about, well, I'm trying to think how many years, about five years ago, we released the first wines under our double barrel range. And the idea came from a couple of guys who were sitting down having a drink. I think they were having some spirits at the time. And they thought, well, what would wine look like, um, you know, if they were finished off in, in spirit barrels? So that led to about two years of work and trial work um, here at the, the winery in the Barossa. Um, we originally trialled three varieties, so Shiraz, Cabernet and Merlot and we spread it across a, you know, a different ranges of spirit barrels. So we had Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, uh, we had bourbon, we had fortified barrels, we had rum, and we, we trialled these three different varieties across different permutations of spirit barrels to see what worked the best. In the end, uh, we went with um, Shiraz into Scotch whiskey and Cabernet into Irish whiskey barrels. These just seemed to integrate as the best with the, the styles of the wine. Um, so in 2014, we released the 2012 vintage of both Shiraz and Cabernet under our double barrel range. And um, it was one of those things, I guess, sometimes you don't know how they're going to go in the market, but they, they, they were really, you know, really well received in the market and been quite successful in terms of how they've been taken up. So we released originally in Australia and we've rolled it out um, globally since then. Um, I guess what we were looking for, we, I guess we didn't know originally when we, we started out with the project. Um, but the way we make the wine is we start and we age the wines traditionally in, in um, traditional wine oak. You can see a couple of barrels further down there, those traditional wine oak barrels. We do about 12 to 18 months um, aging, so it goes through malolactic fermentation and maturation. We bring them out, we blend it in tank, and then we finish the wines off in the, the whiskey barrels, whichever style it happens to be. Um, we generally go about only up to about three months in the whiskey barrel because they're smaller barrels, they're thinner stage, they let a lot more oxygen through. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time in those because we'll start to oxidise the, the primary fruit. But it, what, what it does do is allow the tannins and the wine to soften. Um, so we talk about the wines being richer, deeper, smoother is the catch cry we go with. But, you know, it's about that integration of tannin and, and the changing of the profile. And you can see from the barrels behind me, they are quite old. They've been through multiple lives before they get here and they're, they're used in the um, double barrel process. Um, you know, and it really is about you know, not dominating the wine, but how it impacts and how it changes the wine profile. Um, so it's about softness, it's about integration um, and generosity as well. So we really want to start with actually quite a powerful wine to be able to handle going through that double barrel process again. I think it's just something a bit different, a bit unique. And, and one of the hardest things with wine is there's such a competitive market out there. There's so many different wines to try. Um, that having something that people, you know, want to grab off the shelf, they look at it and they go, oh, this is an interesting story and they want to understand a bit more about it. But more importantly, the wine has to stack up once they try it. And I think inherently, yes, it's important that there's something interesting and people want to try it, but the quality of the wine at the end of the day is the most important thing that makes people coming back. And that's what we've really seen throughout the, the time that there's been in the market, that the repeat purchase on the wine has been really high. So when people you know, go, oh, double barrel, that's interesting. I wonder what it's going to taste like as a wine. They get it, they buy it, and then they drink it, and they go, no, this is lovely, and they come back and they buy it again and again. And, and, and that's probably the most important thing is actually the quality behind it, the winemaking, the attention to detail. Um, and that two years of trial work was really about nailing the brief and nailing the, the wine and what people would be drinking at the end of the day. And you know, it's one of those things as a winemaker, you go, oh, you know, is it gonna work, isn't it? But it has, and it's, it's down to a lot of, you know, you know, getting the concept right in terms of people wanna take it off the shelf, but also the, the, the wine that they're drinking at the end of the day. So when I first started at Jacobs Creek, I guess one of our new product developments was our double barrel Chardonnay, which was a line extension of our double barrel, our extremely popular double barrel reds, the Shiraz and the Cabernet. So there was a lot of trials and tribulations, I should say, in relation to actually bringing this this wine to to the fore and actually getting it out on market. Because how we were going to do it, we thought 
we didn't quite fit the same mould as how we make the reds, which is the reds are made in a traditional style of red wine making and they're aged in the whiskey barrels for a few months prior to getting out in the market. But that didn't quite work with the white wines because we felt the whiskey barrel was just kind of added too much. They didn't kind of integrate that well with the, the Chardonnay. So we played around with fermentation, whether we ferment in the whiskey barrels and well, whether we age it in the whiskey barrels, how it all came about. So I guess our final decision was there was a lot of, as I said, a lot of different ways of doing it. Lots of dis different whiskey barrels as well, whether it be Scotch whiskey, whether it be Irish whiskey as well. So what we finally ended up with was the Scotch whiskey barrel. So what we actually do is ferment half the juice in the whiskey barrels and half the juice in traditional French barrels. And then once they've finished their primary fermentation, we swap them over. So the balance, the half that was fermented in the whiskey barrels is then aged in the traditional barrels and vice versa. So it was a really interesting project to be on because we weren't quite sure the style of wine that we were going to end up with. I guess a lot of people thought we'd end up with quite a big, overt, voluptuous style of wine, but we didn't actually end up with that at all. It still has the lovely traditional Chardonnay notes, but it's also a bit more of a a drive and like almost like a peanut brittle note coming through the wine as well. So it's really interesting and it's, it is the Chardonnay, but not as you know it. So when we look at Sauvignon Blanc, probably the most popular um, style of Sauvignon Blanc we see out throughout the world is Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Well, that's Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. We're probably not going to make that style of wine, nor do we want to make that style of wine here in Australia. So we made the decision we wanted a fresh fruit driven style of Sauvignon Blanc, lovely aromatics, crisp and clean, um, probably without the overt punchy tropicals that you're going to tend to see in Sauvignon Blanc. And, but we still have to make our Australian um, Sauvignon Blanc. And over time, you know, the style of our Sauvignon Blanc has evolved a little bit, but inherently it's still um, true varietal um, Sauvignon Blanc from here in Australia. So when you think about Jacobs Creek Sauvignon Blanc coming into existence, not being there before 2007, this is where the relationships with the growers are really important because you can't make wine if the grapes aren't planted in, in, in the ground. So we need to get the grapes from somewhere. So this is where we can go out, talk to our growers, say this is what we see on the horizon. This is what the market's informing us they want. So uh, we can go and form that relationship, get them to plant them and also give them that, those long-term contracts so that they know that in 10 years time they can still be selling those Sauvignon Blancs. It's worth planting those grapes in the ground. Um, so, you know, when in the case of Sauvignon Blanc, it's, you know, still there um, all these years later. Uh, we still need those grapes. So you know, it's great when we can have that vision and that long-term um, strategy to, to deliver on, on something that the market really calls for. Um, and I think the success of Sauvignon Blanc really articulates that. Um, you still see throughout the world Sauvignon Blanc going really well. But what we want to do here in Australia is make our style of Sauvignon Blanc as well. So that's really important too when uh, we decide that we're going to make a new product. We know what we want to do as well um, and how we want to make it, make it and what style of Sauvignon Blanc we want to make if it happens to be Sauvignon Blanc. The Mighty Murray, Australia's longest river, from its source in the Victorian Alps all the way down to Lake Alexandrina where it empties into the Great Southern Ocean, it's over two and a half thousand kilometres long. Over that length, it passes through three states, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. It provides Adelaide with almost half its water needs and crucially, it's the irrigation basin, the lifeblood for Australia's two largest wine regions, Murray-Darling and the Riverland. It's from these two wine regions that the core of the fruit for the Jacobs Creek Classic Range comes. So we've come here to talk to growers, viticulturalists and winemakers to learn the stories and secrets behind the wine and to find out where it all begins in the vineyards. It was a soldier settlers area back in the 50s when it was first started and uh, it uh, was traditionally um, dried fruit and now it's uh, wine grapes. In the early days it was all, it was a variety. They had oranges, stone fruit, dried fruit and wine grapes. So, but over the, over the journey, most of the, um, well, the stone fruit, dried fruit, um, wasn't paying, wasn't profitable. Some of the benefits that I think is for the Riverland for producing grapes is um, our climate is clearly, we're very dry here. So we, we're not organic, but we're as close to organic as you almost could get without going organic. Mm -hmm. So our, our main spray would be sulfur for powdery. We do very little rot sprays, only on certain varieties, 
only if the season permits, really. And in terms of downy mildew, we only really have to worry about that if we have events early in spring. We'll do very few downy sprays, mm. maybe a bit of copper and, and mancozeb occasionally. Our journey in, in, in wakery and uh, becoming grape growers started in, uh, in the late 1890s when I, uh, my great grandfather was actually a, uh, a salesman and he would wander the Riverland selling to shops and the like and decided with uh, his family that Wakery was a good place to settle. So uh, they settled here in 1904 and then started as I um, started with dried fruits and, and that sort of crop. And it wasn't until 1920 that my grandfather, who had then taken over that family property due to the death of one of the, the family, um, he was the one and his name was Kenneth Thompson and he planted the first Shiraz certainly within our family um, that plotted along until my father was born in 1927 um, and then he, he, by the time he was 16, was also working on the property and ultimately took over from my grandfather and then um, um, I took over uh, running our properties in probably in, dear, in, the, in the 70s, I, th I think it was, and uh, then we, we uh, expanded uh, uh, into wine grapes as we now operate today. The, the modern generation are taking over our property now um, and uh, I have two sons in, in our business. Uh, my third son is actually a, a banker so he arranges the finances for his brothers. So um, Raymond is, in, is very much in charge of our machine, machinery side of things, takes care of harvesters, trucks and the machines that are used on the property. And Aaron is, is definitely the, uh, the guy very heavily into actually growing and being the viticulturalist and dealing with all of the daily activity of actually growing the crop. Um, both of them work together very well. Um, they would have a lot of consultation together when it comes to fertility, what sort of fertilizers we put on, what sort of sprays, um, because they do vary from time to time. And the one thing we've done in recent years is gone back to a more heavily organic based fertilizer system, which in fairness to both my boys, they worked it all through. and. Uh, I think it's going to be in pretty good hands. And, and where grapes, grapes took, took over. And it was because it was man mechanical harvested, um, it was easier for us to not employ and use mechanical pruning and harvesting. That's how the wine grew from, oh, I would think, up to, I don't know, the region must go somewhere around 400,000 tonne. So it's all wine grapes now. My first vineyard is where I am sitting today. It's only a four hectare vineyard. Well, we had the old Palominos, the Sultanas, um, all the old Gordos, Doradillas, all hand-picked fruit. Um, the, the change was probably in the, <coughs> well, all the Chardonnay and all that started coming in in the oh, late 80s, I think. The dominant variety was first was Shiraz, and which this region is well known for. And then, then came the, the Chardonnay. The Chardonnay was big. Um, and, and then after, oh, well, I suppose 10 years ago, they asked us to plant Sauvignon Blanc, and, and that's a real winner for this area, you know, like, it's, it's, it's been good, yeah, like we can grow pretty good Sauvignon Blanc. It, it, was, it was a very interesting time, watching the young vines grow, wanting planting varieties that Jacob's Creek needed for their, their markets, and it, yeah, it was good. Soldier settlers were people who returned from the Second World War, uh, and they were, there was quite a few places around, there was wheat farms, irrigation farms that they, uh, at that time, in the uh, late 40s, that they opened up for these people to come home and have a job. So they basically uh, started off with uh, uh, 20, 30, 50 acres of purely uh, land with trees and scrub. Um, they put the irrigation, it was channels back then, so it was all channel irrigated back to those farms, and they took water and over the years planted citrus, dried fruit, uh, it was mainly the the two major things then that were done. Uh, and then since um, the wineries come in, probably back in the, uh, the 2000s, 
and that was the biggest change you've probably ever seen in history within these irrigation areas where it, the boom just come in and uh, there was mass buyouts, um, modernisation in irrigation and uh, it was just so much easier to, to go rather than the old, the old dried fruit was a pretty hard thing to, to go about. It was, it was fine for a while, uh, but it certainly makes growing wine grapes a lot easier. And may surprise people to know we're right on the banks of Jacobs Creek here. So the tree line you can see behind me is the famous, world famous Jacobs Creek. It's a beautiful crisp autumn morning on the 7th of March here in the Wallandra Vineyard in the Barossa Valley. It's uh, quite cool at the moment, which is lovely. But um, the vines that we're standing amongst at the moment were planted in 1921. Um, and they're an essential part for, for one of our wines, um, Jacobs Creek Centenary Hill in the heritage range that we have. I guess this is one of the very unique things about Australia. We are not affected by phylloxera here in the Barossa Valley, so we have some of the oldest uh, grapevines in the world. And they really lend a unique um, sort of style and character to the wines we want to make, and particularly Centenary Hill. At the very beginnings of our, uh, our colony here in South Australia, we were the very last of the, South, of the Australian colonies to be set up. And it was actually set up as a private business based in London called the South Australian Company. And the South Australian Company owned the beginnings and the rights to the colony of South Australia, even before government. And Colonel Light was sent out here, who was a British officer as the Surveyor General. And he surveyed and drew up the city of Adelaide. And Adelaide's actually a complete square mile. And when he did that, uh, the government of the day actually wanted the city to be on Kangaroo Island, but Kangaroo Island doesn't have any underground water. So it sits now right in the middle of the Adelaide Plain, a square mile with a beautiful band of parklands all the way around. So this vineyard is owned by the Koch family and I was just talking to Graham Koch, who's the second generation um, uh, sort of tender to this vineyard. His, his father planted these vines and started planting these vines in 1921. And so he's saying that, and I asked, when did you start selling um, um, to us, to, to Jacobs Creek? And he said the first crops that started coming off here. Um, and I don't know the exact year that that would because the, the vines would take a bit of time to establish. But yeah, he said that, uh, as soon as they started uh, yielding crop out here, they started selling it to, um, to Jacobs Creek, where our winery is actually just over the hill in front of me here. So, and that's how it was sort of in those days, the, the vineyards that were closest to the winery because it was hard to, to transport the grapes around the region. The roads weren't as good, obviously no trucks. Um, so it would go to the winery that was closest. Our business actually gets most of its grapes um, off private private families that grow that run their own vineyards. So this vineyard and particularly others in the Barossa here, there's a lot of small family owned vineyards and so they're essential um, to allow us to create the wines that we want to. Um, and also those small family owned vineyards are often the more unique ones that they've, they've been around for a long time. So, so these, these families like the Koch family, third generation are really important to us. And so that's why we like to maintain these long term relationships um, this family sold their first crops to us, um, but also throughout the Barossa Valley where we've got those long-term relationships and also throughout the rest of Australia as well. I think the main block of the vineyard was completed, completely planted by about 1930. And uh, things have changed a lot over the years. It was all uh, horse-drawn uh, flowers and things that used for cultivation. Families related to the Gramps who uh, started the uh, winery and uh, it just seemed like the right thing to do then and there weren't no other real close wineries and uh, things had to be transported by horse and wagon so uh, that seemed to be the logical thing to do. This month right now is the hundred years since they bought this property and we've had a relationship uh, with the Koch family since the very beginning so it's fantastic to know that we have this partnership, this heritage and this history with these families right back to the very beginnings of when they, when they started. We're here in Langhorn Creek, which is one of the five wine regions on the Fleuria Peninsula, south of Adelaide in South Australia. The region can trace its roots back to the 1860s, and one of the key elements of its terroir is this cooling breeze from nearby Lake Alexandrina. Here, Jacobs Creek has a vineyard of over 600 hectares, which actually makes up almost 10% of the entire wine region. And this is a premium wine region, and the fruit from these vineyards gives uplift to the Jacobs Creek Classic Range, which sits at $12. So really you could say the Langhorn Creek Vineyard is one of the best kept secrets of the Jacobs Creek Range. So we're actually in Langhorn Creek. So that's a region in South Australia. It's about an hour and a half drive south of Adelaide. So 
The beauty of Langhorne Creek, and especially in the classic Riesling, is that it gets those southerly winds, so the temperature never gets particularly hot or too cold. It can get slightly humid, but I think the Riesling actually quite enjoys that as well. So the thing I love about Langhorne Creek that makes up a lot of the classic Riesling blend is its natural acidity because of that coolness in the region. That acidity actually maintains itself in the grape. And as we all know, Riesling is a variety that we need to have the acid line, and that's what we do at Jacobs Creek as well. We like to make a Riesling that's very true to style. So there's not a lot of phenolics. It's all about the flavor of the flute, fruit, the aromatics and the acid line as well. We're in Langon Creek. Uh, this is a Shiraz vineyard behind me. Um, I mentioned earlier that Langon Creek's a, a really important region for us because Langon Creek's one of those regions that supports uh, products from almost Q1 uh, into, you know, grapes from Langon Creek have gone into Johan. Uh, in the Jacobs Creek Heritage Range. Uh, it also supports uh, Jacobs Creek Reserve uh, as some other fruits. So while it's a limestone coast or appellated product, you are allowed to add 10% other. And, and we certainly use Langon Creek to give a bit of extra you know, body and, and lusciousness to the wines. Uh, we then uh, um, look at uh, La Petite Rosé and Pinot Noir comes from here to support that brand. Uh, and then we look at our Jacobs Creek Classic and it's sort of a lot of supply we utilise here to, to really just add a little bit of a lift to Jacobs Creek Classic and just uh, give it a bit more, I, I use the term lusciousness, but uh, you know, that uh, uh, structure and things. Um, so we do run a, a within the tended use system, a quality level. So you've got a, 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 a St Hugo or Johan Heritage Range is a Q1 and Reserve is a Q2 and La Petite or Cool Harvest is a Q3 uh, and then Jacobs Creek Classic is a Q4. So here in Langhorne Creek, uh, we're situated quite close to Lake Alexandrina, uh, which is to the south of us. Uh, we get a bit of a cool breeze, which makes the climate a little bit more moderate and cool, uh, which is, makes some really good acid lines through the whites. Um, the vineyard was established about 20 years ago uh, and consists of two sections. So LC1, which is where we are now, uh, which is the first part of the development, which is 330 hectares. And then there's LC2, which is about a K further south, and that's uh, about 300 hectares there. So the varietal mix here in Langhorne Creek consists of um, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, Cabernet Merlot, Grenache, and a little bit of Pinot Gris, um, Shiraz as well. Uh, so being a premium sort of region, um, these products end up anything from double barrel, and it also ends up into our classic range. Um, for the classic range side of things, they really rely on this fruit, actually creating a bit of uplift, a bit of freshness, um, and making quite a good wine out of it. Uh, yeah, and then it also has the ability to actually deliver double barrel off here as well. So as owned vineyards, we're used a little bit to dial up and dial down in the quality ranges, um, and that's to do with supply and demand as well. So each year, you know, we get a set of figures of what qualities or tendon uses we have to meet and then we kind of manage our system that way. Uh, so when they first established this vineyard, um, Jacobs Creek, they went to a lot of effort and the whole 630 hectares was actually soil pitted and then from those soil pits they designed the irrigation system and actually laid out clones and rootstocks and varietals to match those soil profiles. Uh, in doing that, they've actually given us the ability to actually segregate little parcels off here and there for when we do need to actually go up to those Q2 levels and also given us the ability to, you know, just do Q4 if we need to. Um, you know, back then a lot of it was manually done, a bit of computer, computer systems, but now I can actually irrigate the whole system as well as any own vineyards we have from my iPhone. So can sit at home and if I have to water when the heat's coming, you know, we have the ability to react fast when we need to. So I think the beauty of the classic Riesling is we are very lucky that we're able to source fruit from premium regions such as Langhorn Creek. So I know a lot of the other winemakers in the portfolio kind of get a bit jealous of me in regards to the Riesling because I can source fruit from Langhorn Creek and Clare for the classic Riesling. And the beauty is it's, it does maintain the acid line so and because it is a cooler region rather than some of the warmer regions we do source from for our other classic varieties it's it just makes the Riesling true to style 
and what we're known for at Jacobs Creek because I think Jacobs Creek, it was one of the first white, well, it was the first white variety that we actually released under the Jacobs Creek brand. So it's really true, um, true to our heart and we really are very, very proud of the Rieslings that we put out under Jacobs Creek. So with the Riesling, we generally harvest in the night where it is the coolest part of the day as well. And then the fruit is, depending on where, what quality level we actually think the blocks are because it is quite a big vineyard. It's 100 hectares for Riesling just here at Langhorn Creek. So the winemakers actually do come through and assess the blocks individually. So we come through, have a look at the grapes, see how they're looking. And so we do kind of divvy them up in regards to where they're going to be processed. So the blocks that we think are the better blocks will actually process here at a contract winery in Langhorn Creek. And the blocks that we don't deem as great, I guess, they actually will get trucked to, to roll and flat. And then once the fruit comes into the winery, we try to separate the skins from the juice immediately. So we don't want any of those phenolics coming through at all. So they'll get crushed, they'll go through the press, they'll go through um, a heat exchanger so the juice ma maintains its coldness and then we'll separate any solids as well and then we'll pretty much put it straight to ferment immediately so we don't see any skin contact, we don't see any phenolics coming through as well and the press cut we do take quite low for Riesling in comparison to, to some other varieties as well so I guess for the Langhorn Creek and Clare Riesling, we aim for around that 600 litres per tonne and anything for Steingarten, we can take around that 550, depending on what the vintage is like as well. So as I said, we'll clean up that juice. We'll put it to ferment immediately. So we generally use QA23, which is quite an aromatic strain, but it's a good fermenter as well. And we'll also, we do play around with Siha 7, Siha 7. It's, uh, it's actually an isolate from Germany. I think and it does give those kind of lovely lifted aromatics as well so we'll generally ferment that quite cool around 14 to 16 degrees maybe 13 depending on how fast the ferment is going as well we do want a nice cool long ferment we don't want it to go through too quick because otherwise we'll lose all those lovely aromatics that Riesling is well known for so pretty much once the ferment's dry we'll clean it up we'll get it off those yeast leaves by either a centrifuge or a filtration and then we pretty much stabilise it, we'll heat stabilise it, we'll cold stabilise it, then it gets filtered and we try and get it into bottle as soon as possible. So our release date for the classic Riesling is generally around that July, the same year as vintage. So today is the 21st of Feb, but for me vintage starts well before Christmas. I like to come out, just have a look how the, the vineyard's shaping up, because I mean, there's a lot of um, activities that can actually affect how the vine's looking, whether it be hail, frost, just the weather patterns in itself and the growing season, how the bunch is forming, everything like that. So I like to come out and have a look before Christmas. And then once Christmas has happened, like we try and come out around January as well, just to see how, once again, how the, the canopy is coming along. So we start to take Beaumets, I guess, around that middle of Jan here in Langhorn Creek, and we'll just get a, a Beaumets just to see how things are tracking along. But then once it gets around the eight to nine Beaumets, we'll probably start to take two Beaumets a week just to see how things are tracking and to see how, how if it's warm, like the Beaumets may go a lot quicker than if it's a bit cooler as well. So the winemakers, we generally like to come out here a few times before harvest as well just to see how as I said things are tracking along so we come along we have a look at the um the grapes the bunches the canopy as a whole just the whole vineyard see how it's looking and see if it's all in balance like you're not looking for massive shoot growth at this time of year as well you want the canopy to be kind of stopped and all the fruit all the growth being and the sugar everything going into the berries as well so we come along, we taste the fruit, we make sure, especially for reasoning, that the skins aren't too thick, they're not too phenolic as well. You still want that lovely aromatic and acid line coming through for the Riesling. So we have a look, we make sure the aromatics are there as well, just because that's so, as I said, that is so important about Riesling as a whole. So you can see they're not massive bunches as well for Riesling, they are quite compact and the berries aren't particularly huge but they can get quite juicy as well and so the phenolics the skins can be slightly phenolic but we try to minimize that as much as possible and the seeds you're looking for I guess a bit of brownness but because we aim for a slightly lower bome for the reasoning we don't want them to be completely brown and completely lignified as well the favorite part of my job is I actually make the wines that I love to drink
So, I mean, I'm very true to my portfolio. I love Riesling, I love Chardonnay, I love sparkling wine. So actually making those wines that you do enjoy the most is the most satisfying part of my role.